just um, entered our, our online space. It's so great to have you all here. Uh, we really appreciate you coming online and we hope that it'll be an interesting webinar mini workshop for you. We'll be talking about how to write a short story, what is a short story, and we'll be um, giving you an opportunity to do a little bit of writing in the second half of the, of the webinar. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Joanne Hitchens, and my co-host today is uh, Karina Surik. Um, and we are going to be the editors of the next collection of Short Sharp Stories, which is going to be titled Fluid, The Freedom to Be. Um, we think it's a, it's a really important um, title um, for, for various reasons, for the, the fluidity of boundaries, the fluidity of gender, um, but we're going to get to that a little bit later in the workshop. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to speak very briefly about uh, Short Sharp Stories. Um, it was first started in 2014. And our first publish and th published anthology was Bloody Satisfied, which Karina's going to hold up for you. Um, yeah, there we go. It was a collection of crime fiction short stories, which did very well, had several reprints, forward by Dion Mayer. It was very exciting. The reason I had started Short Shop Stories um, in the first place um, sorry, I hope my dog's barking in the background is not irritating everybody. Yay, brilliant. Thanks, Karina. Um, was that I felt we needed some kind of short story competition for South Africans um, for sh uh, to showcase South African writers, but also stories that were set in South Africa, stories that had a South African sensibility. So uh, we were lucky enough at that stage to get funding from um, the National Arts Council. And we did uh, six volumes with them. One of those volumes was online. It was the, uh, the latest one, which was called um, uh, Instant Exposure. Um, and the, you know, the wonderful thing about uh, putting together those anthologies was we got a lot of entries between, let's say, 300 to 5,000, uh, 300 to 500 entries a year, which we thought was fantastic. And we, we encouraged new writers, emerging writers, as well as the top writers of South Africa to apply, to be published and for the grand prize, which meant that when we came to public, publication, there was a real mix of authors. Um, and it also gave new writers and emerging writers the opportunity to be published. So instead of actually going to the top writers and saying, please write for our anthology, we got an incredible mix of stories and we discovered some amazing talent. And some of those new writers, emerging writers are still writing today. Some of them have gone on to win major prizes. Um, Lidudu Malingani won the uh, Kane Prize, I think, in 2016 for his story, An Incredible Journey, which is here. Um, and um, Bongani Corner uh, also was shortlisted for the Kane Prize for his story in that collection. Um, Lidudu Malingani also won the Miles Moreland Scholarship. But more than that, we just created this platform that people, writers were excited about. Um, and then, of course, you know, sometimes life happens. Um, and for me, I had a death in my family. My husband passed on. And I think that really affected me emotionally, which I think one can understand fully. Um, but I, I kind of lost my capacity to carry on the competition and and and. Um, Although we tried to do it online, um, it really didn't work. But I've always kept the desire to, to reinstate the competition because I could see how important it was for people. And that's what we're doing now. We got funding from the National Arts Council and we can't wait to read this batch of stories um, and to put together a really exciting print version um, and also to place stories in, in magazines, to, to place stories in, in, um, in, in other, in other uh, mediums or also online. What we also didn't say 
um, in the call for short stories is that everybody who writes a story will get um, some feedback, even if it's a paragraph or two. And we're really hoping that in this way, our new writers will be encouraged to write more. Because often when one gets a rejection or a story isn't published, one sits thinking, well, why not? What was the problem with it? That's why we're also doing these workshops so that um, our writers have a sense of what a short story is all about. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, to, to just to, to, I'm going to just speak for another moment or two, and then I'd like Karina also to, to jump in and, and uh, say a few things. But short stories have traditionally been where writers cut their teeth. So it is just a great opportunity for new writers to test themselves, to play with ideas. And a short story um, is a great place to explore writing because it's short. Basically, that is the bottom line. So you're not giving yourself over to a novel or a nonfiction uh, tome, which is going to take three to five years of your life. It is really about pushing yourself into that short story space, creating a short story and spending a month or two on it, um, getting some feedback and then learning from that, honing the craft in a sense. So that's what is exciting about the short stories. And of course, it's open to South African residents um, or South, South African citizens, residents um, of South Africa. Um, so as long as the story has a South African sensibility. So we're really hoping for a range of short stories. Okay, Karina, would you like to um jump in and and introduce yourself and and tell us why you love the short story yeah uh, once again welcome everybody it's an, a real privilege to be here with you and thank you so much for this lovely warm response to our call um i am very passionate about the short story it has always been a form that has intrigued me as a as a writer and as an editor and more recently as a um as a publisher. The first uh, book that appeared apart from, from academic writing, but the, the first book that appeared with my name on it was a collection of short stories, Touch. Uh, I will be uh, using an excerpt from one of the stories that was included here in 2009 later in the workshop. And I'm involved with, with uh, several projects that are very closely connected to the short story. Short Trap Stories is one of them. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Joanne invited me to come on board as a reader and as an editor, and I was also a judge for Die Laughing for this collection. Um, and uh, I'm also involved with uh, the wonderful project that is uh, not only South African, but African, um, a short story day Africa, founded by Rachel Zadok. I'm a board member there, and I also had the, the, had the huge honor to uh, edit uh, one of their anthologies, Water, and the most recent one that I co-edited, um, Disruption. And the Kane Prize of this year comes from our our disruption uh huge honor and and very gratifying and uh the one of the books that i most recently published as an editor was the one that joanne and i did last which which is one of the reasons why we want to work together again because this was just an amazing project here it wasn't a competition there we invited writers to come on board and what I also want to mention that as a publisher at Caravan Press, I'm also, I, I've only until now published one short story collection, and that is was, uh, Lester Walbrook's uh, Let It Fall Where It Will. But there are others coming next year, and um, all of the authors that are published have been published by Short Trap Stories before. Um, so so it, it's, it's a project that I've been, from the start, very passionate about simply as a reader and as a reviewer. So it's, it's a great pleasure to be on board in, in a more closer collaboration with Joanne. And short, sharp stories. Mm -hmm. Short, sharp stories, yes. Um, to begin with the more uh, sort of technical part of the, of the workshop, <laughs> Um, I'm sure that all of you will have some kind of an idea of what a short story is. Um, and, you know, there are, I don't know how many books out there about uh, the short story. You can Google, you will have a million definitions. 
and and I am not going to pin us down to one, but uh, one of the most uh, um, useful ones that I uh, find is that it is simply a story that has a fully developed theme. In our case, that theme will be fluid. We will talk about that in detail a little bit later, but it is a fully developed theme. Um, and uh, also a very useful uh, definition that I um, like is that a short story can be read in one sitting. And of course, length is, is an issue. And um, we all know that there are all kinds of sub um, forms. Uh, the most famous one will be flash fiction. And there the definitions will also uh, differ in length. Uh, a flash a story can be between six to roughly 1,000 words. Um, I don't think that the definition of flash fiction would go beyond that. So it is just basically about the brevity. But also what I love about the form is that, that the, the short story is for me uh, the perfect space to exercise your absolute precision as a writer. It's almost like writing poetry, but with prose. I, when, when, I, uh, when I read short stories, I always watch out for, you know, how do writers make every single sentence, every single word count? It's, it's and, and for me also every single line, how do these elements work in order to convey whatever you want to do with the short story? Um, I think it's a very exciting form. I love that that you can just, you know, turn to a book uh, for 10, 15 minutes, lose yourself completely in a different world, and then emerge and go on with your day. I think um, what is also wonderful about the uh, short story is that it, um, it uh, like Joanne mentioned, it allows you to, so many possibilities in a, in a relatively uh, short time. And yet, if it's, if it's well, well done, when somebody is at the top of their craft, a short story can express as much as any long form, a novella or a novel. Um, most short stories in length will be between 3,000 to 5,000 words. Whenever you enter competitions, that is roughly the guideline. That is what we are doing as well. Uh, but I know that, for example, for the Kane Prize, they uh, accept entries up to, I think, 10,000 words. Um, that could already be a fully developed novella, but yeah, <laughs> those boundaries are also very fluid. Um, you will probably be uh, familiar with the most um, uh, with the most essential elements of a, a short story, and I think um, I'm not a stickler for for rules or, or guidelines or you know very pre precise definitions, but I think it's sometimes very important to immerse yourself in the technicalities so that you are aware of what tools are at your disposal. And especially when it comes to uh, problem solutions, I find myself very often when I begin writing a story that I will have an idea, an image will come, a character, a piece of dialogue or something, and I will start to exploring all of, all of it and then uh, write myself into a corner. And then I don't know what to do unless I try you know, what are the tools in my toolbox and see, you know, does a change of perspective um, help me along? Does a point of view or, or a different character or maybe even just a tense? If I change from present tense to past tense, will that affect the storytelling? Will that allow me to uh, move into a different space? Or, or a simple thing like, um, uh, taking a scene that you want to convey and changing dialogue into a description or the other way around. You have, you have described the scene and you think, no, this is just simply not working, but will it work as dialogue? Will the same content in dialogue convey what you want to know? So I think that is why it's important to know these things. And I'm going to run through them as quickly as possible because I think most of them are known to most of you. Uh, but just in case there will be time uh, for, for questions, so just stop me or, or in the, I'm going to try to uh, monitor the, the chat in case there is something that's, that is not clear. So the, the main elements of a short story. 
uh, obviously point of view. Uh, is your narrator a first person narrator, second person or third person narrator? Then the second choice that one immediately has to make is, is, your, is the narrator going to be involved or uninvolved in your story? So basically, is it so, somebody who is just an observer and telling the story, or is that narrator part of the character setup or part of the action? Uh, the main um, um, distinctions are omniscient and limited. So an omniscient narrator is almost like a god um, who can see anything uh, and can describe anything, can go into all the even uh, head spaces, knows everything about everyone in the story. Uh, a limited um, uh, point of view will have, of course, some kind of then um, uh, boundaries. Um, then uh, when it comes to point of view, uh, one also has to um, uh, focus on whether that narrator is involved in a physical way in the story, if it is an involved narr narrator as a character. So, so where physically is the narrator in relation to the story that you are trying to tell? And the other distinction psychologically. So what is the narrator's attitude towards the story that is being told? Um, Another uh, two distinctions about narrators, I think that most uh, uh, writers would have heard about is the reliable and unreliable narrator. Um, so as a reader, basically, it's all about trust. When you are reading, is it, I, I, are you believing what you are reading? Uh, are you trusting in the narrator that they are telling you the truth? Um, and of course, the narrator can have vested interests, can use, so you as the author can use irony, distortion, any kinds of ways of manipulation that will make your um, narrator unreliable. Um, there is an option of uh, writing stories, um, novels, uh, without a narrator. Most people are not aware of that, but, but if you think about it, for example, an epistolary novel will have no narrator. It's just a collection of letters. One can imagine, for example, a collection of a different kind of documents um, or diary entries. Um, in more recent times, there have been novels without narrators where only text messages or Facebook messages are what constitutes the, the story or the novel. Um, interviews as well. Uh, somebody whom I uh, read recently who uses the, these kind of elements to great effect, even though she does always have a narrator uh, as a kind of framework for the rest of the story is Sarah Lotz in, in, in her novels. So yeah, it's, I think it's, it's important to know one's options. The next element that is very crucial, of course, is your um, plot. And plot is not just a summary of events that happen in the story. Uh, by, by plot is, is the, the kind of decision-making that you as an author make in, in how you arrange the story um, and the events in the story. What the, this entails is also whether you are focusing on the physical aspect of what is happening of the events or of the, what the characters go through or whether it's uh, actually psychological action or a combination of both. Mostly it will be both, obviously. Then another thing to consider that plot can be something very, very uh, subtle. It can be really just the everyday, or it can almost disappear in the background of what you are trying to, to tell. Um, but it also can be literally sh earth shattering events. It, you can have a volcano eruption in the middle of your story, and that will be a plot element. Um, what is most important is that, that when, when you are plotting your short story, that you focus on the core of what you want to, want to convey, whether it's a theme, whether it's a feeling, whether it's an idea, that, that it all comes together. And there are all kinds of choices here uh, with chronology, whether you use elements like surprise or suspense or flashbacks or um, a foreshadowing. Um, whether you build up to a conflict, you know, that, that very classical storytelling arc where you have an exposition, 
a, a, a kind of climax or conflict and then a conclusion. So that triangular um, um, it, yeah, the, uh, plot structure. And, and of course, there is the possibility also of a frame. So you have a frame story that frames the, the story that you are telling, I don't know, uh, two people meet and then reminiscent about something in the past, for example. Um, the next element of the short story, very, very important, of course, is characters. Uh, we are all social creatures. And I think that is what mostly fascinates us about, about storytelling, that uh, stories allow us an insight into other people um, other than ourselves. Uh, they are incredible tools in building understanding and, and compassion and empathy. And, and, and ob obviously we all live only one life, but if we read books, we live many, many lives, even more than cats. So, so that is that is the the, the beauty of, of well crafted characters that they allow us to really transport ourselves into into other lives. Um, distinctions with characters: uh, the main one will be a flat character or a rounded character. A flat character will be uh, purely functional. So not somebody who is uh, your, uh, not necessarily your protagonist, but some, somebody who is necessary to bring your uh, story across, but just fulfills a, a very specific function. And the rounded character will be, will have psychological depth, will be very complex, will be layered. And um, the, the best way to think about a rounded character is that once you have read about them, in a story, can you imagine what that kind of person would do in a completely different situation beyond the story? If you can, then your character is probably very well-rounded because you can really think yourselves into their uh, shoes. Um, then another aspect to consider with characters is what is their motivation? Um, in life, people are very unpredictable, but fiction has different kind of demands, and we usually want some kind of consistency as some kind of um, a predictability. It often jars when, when a character who, who you follow throughout the story does something that you think, but no, 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 hang on, that kind of person wouldn't do that sort of thing. So, so implausibility in fiction is, is something different uh, than impossibility in life. So it's something to keep um, in mind when you are writing. Uh, and of course, the, the two main uh, types of characters, you will either have a hero or a villain or a mixture of the two. And it's all about whether you can, you, somebody is likable or not, basically. And what I find most important is what makes them tick, you know? It, it doesn't matter whether somebody is likable or not as a character, it's, it's whether you as a reader, you're reading about them and you actually, you just want to know what makes them the people that they are, the characters that they are. Do they have soul? Um, the next element is setting. Um, and here it's pretty straightforward. It's time and place. Time is a little bit simpler. It's either contemporary or historical. Um, and place can be anything that your imagination will take you uh, to. Uh, what I think is very important in setting that if you use it consciously, that it can it can add another kind of um, uh, complexity to a story. Uh, for example, a setting can um, exemplify the social status of a character, it can reveal character, for example, uh, if you portray somebody in a, in a very, very neat setting, like they are, you know, in a, in a very uh, Marie Kondo kind of um, uh, room. Um, then it might, if, if they are the, the, the person who has designed that space, it might reveal something about their character. It can also be setting can be a symbolic um, and 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 especially uh, something as simple as passage of time. If you, for example, in your story, re, uh, use seasons, 
to um, also show a, a character change or some kind of development and in the journey, then you will also have you will have time and place working towards the um, complexity of your story. Um, then another element uh, very often used and 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 uh, very um, enriching is symbols. Um, symbols is basically anything in the story that refers to more than itself. A, a very um, uh, ordinary example would be an apple. If you portray in your story an apple in the fruit bowl, it will have, it will just be an apple. But add a snake to the apple and you will have all kinds of connotations opening up uh, for the knowledge, uh, disobedience, uh, women, whatever, whatever it, 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 it goes way beyond just that object. Um, symbols can be traditional. So, so for example, a cross in religion will, will have a meaning that is, that is traditional and will bring all those connotations with it. Or it can be something very representative. I was just trying to think of the first thing that would come to my mind as an example. And I thought immediately of the agar stove. If you put an agar stove very wisely into your story, it can have a symbol for an entire way of life. Um, so, so something as, as ordinary as an object uh, can have representative functions in the story if used wisely. Then of course, levels of symbolic meaning can be very simple, very, very uh, accessible, or they can be more and more layered and you can introduce them into a story. They can also shift, um, become very complex and really change meaning. So something at the beginning of the story might have a, a, a an object might have a completely different meaning uh, towards the end. And obviously a context is vital. And um, the last element that I would like to speak before turning to examples are themes. And um, for, for us, it's quite straightforward. We do have a theme for the stories that we are going to be writing. It is fluid. But the word itself, theme, I think is, is quite important to know that it derives from the Greek root of to set down something. So to set down. So a theme is basically the notion an author hopes to set down in a story. And this can be an exploration of, the, of that theme. It can be a way of advance, uh, to advance ideas, or it, it, it can be something that, for example, you want to change attitudes about. And I think in, in our case with fluidity, uh, we hopefully, some stories might aim in that direction. And the two examples that I chose for, for us to look at in more uh, detail, I'm just looking, okay, here are the notes. Um, so I know, um, Uh, here. So I chose um, Emma, if I can ask you to please put up um, uh, the example, uh, Damon Gargut's The Crossing. Um, I hope it will be up on the screen. I'm going to read. So this is from Damon Gargut's short story that we included in touch. And I, I, I don't know whether you've heard the news, but I, apparently his next book is going to be a short story collection again, which is very thrilling. And this is the opening of his short story uh, called The Crossing. The morning after the argument, she woke early and knew she wouldn't sleep again. Andrew was curled away from her, very much on his side of the bed. She got dressed and stood for a long moment, looking at the bony shape of his shoulders, the dark outline of his head. Then she went out and down the steps to the beach. It was just after dawn, nobody else was around. High up above, the roofs of the town caught the light, but down at the shore, everything was in shadow. 
The tide was far out, leaving a cryptic calligraphy of swirl marks and debris on the sand. She found herself wandering north to where the beach was closed off by the headland. It was, a sort, it was the sort of point beyond which Andrew wouldn't go because who knew what might happen on the other side, away from order and civilized eyes. But the view past the cemetery was inviting, a narrow strip of sand edged by cliffs with a complexity of boulders at the far end. So um, I, I chose that particular story because, uh, because uh, uh, Damon has been recently in the, in the news, as you all know, and, and I've always been uh, um, a fan of the economy of his beautiful writing. And, and I think, you know, here it's, a, it's a, the opening of a story. We have only three uh, paragraphs, uh, very few sentences. And very quickly, we can recognize some of the elements that I spoke about. So point of view is obviously third person limited. It is definitely through the, the perspective of the one character who is here not named yet, she, and the other character is Andrew. Um, we have no no reason to doubt the the narrator so far. So she, uh, the narrator seems to be reliable, um, but um, we very very quickly know the first elements of the plot. Um, we know that these two characters had a, a argument the previous night. Um, now she uh, is is uh, walking out into the early day on her own, very clearly walking away from uh, the other person. Um, and what is very clear is that there, there is a distance between them, not only a physical, but also psychological distance, and that she is willing to venture beyond Andrew's comfort zone. So not only physically, but, but psychologically. Um, what, what do we know about the characters? Uh, they are possibly a couple. Um, they are possibly traveling together. Uh, there's indication that this is a, a coastal um, town, a place. Uh, they definitely had difference of opinion. And uh, it's quite clear that whereas um, he, Andrew wants to remain within certain comfort zones, she is prepared to take risks. Um, and um, I've, from this, it's very difficult to judge, but one has the sense that it's probably the, 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 the time of the story is contemporary. Um, what I think is most important is that in a very, very economical, straightforward passage, we get a sense of an entire setup. It's so quickly done and, and it seems so easy, but of course it takes a lot of writing and rewriting to get to get that kind of easiness and um, that seamlessness of storytelling. Um, yeah, and the other example that I uh, chose is, Emma, if I may ask you to put up the other example, is from the collection that uh, Joanne and I edited together here. So here you, you also know um, the theme from the start. And uh, I chose this particular one because it just stayed with me. Um, it's, it's one of those stories that, you know, the opening is just so striking that it's very difficult to forget. So this is uh, uh, Mishka Husen and Before We Go. It was a Wednesday that we found the little hand. It was wrapped up in a checkers packet by the train tracks and the dew covered it and hibiscus from the tree over the tracks. The petals trodden down round, round it so that you could make out the outline of the baby's hand reaching through the plastic. Cher said it was for Muti probably, so we could get out there before whoever it was for came to pick it up, so we did. When we ran back into the yard, panting, I said we should probably do the salt in case. She lay down on the duvet and I took the salt from the cupboard, holding a fistful in my hand as I passed it over her, reciting al Fatia. I went to wash it down the sink, careful not to look at it as it left my fingers. It soaked up the evil over her, taking it away, but I thought the hand might have been reaching for us. 
too up to us, insistent. That's how it had looked. So I went back the next day after school, but it was gone. Um, here, just the basics, point of view, first person limited. We know it's one, uh, one of the characters is the narrator in the story. Um, she's probably reliable at this stage it's very difficult to know um, one gets the sense that she might be young just from the uh, description of what do these two have been up to um, and what i love about the plot here uh, and the opening is that it really is a bang it's such a, it's such a grotesque brutal kind of image that we have to start with and yet it very quickly uh, transports us into, into the stories of, of these two uh, people. Um, this very short passage, once again, conveys a lot about the characters. They are probably friends, they play together, they, they are out together a lot, uh, they are probably Muslim. Um, and it says this very short passage also tells us already about the circumstances, about the setting, uh, about the fact that they know about Muti um, and Muti killings. Um, it's very clear just from the description of the packet in which the hand, the little hand, the baby's hand is found that we are here in South Africa. It's a checkers packet. Um, uh, the train tracks, the township setup um, feels very contemporary, um, and and of course uh, the hand is 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 an we don't know yet what the little hand is going to be a symbol for, but it already feels that it is going to be heavy with 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 symbolism. And uh, the theme here, we can't uh, judge anything about the theme from, the, from that short passage, but already in the next um, um, sentence, the theme of hair reveals itself because here the, the evil um, that these two are trying to ward off is something that comes down for the generations to this particular narrator, to this particular character and all that evil and all that heaviness of the past and especially of the lot of uh, women starts communicating to her through her hair. So the hair starts to whisper to her. Um, so yeah, and what, what I, the reason I chose these two openings is simply because they are irresistible. You, you, you have to know what happens next. And this is what um, Joanne is going to tell us uh, more about is, you know, when you have the elements and you know what kind of tools are available to you, what else can you do with them in order to write a good short story? Joanne, over to you. All right. Thanks, Karina. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, sure. Um, that was wonderful, um, a real education on short stories, the elements of the short story, just to recap that one needs a point of view, a character, the setting, the plot, uh, the symbols. Um, so it's not simply about sitting down, rattling off a story and sending it in um, or getting it published. Short stories take a lot of work, um, which is very clear, but uh, we want you to be excited about that, uh, because I think once one understands a little bit more about what is involved in writing, and that it isn't simply taking dictation from God, then that is where the magic happens. Because once we have an idea, once we get a rough draft of a story down, we can start to work with those elements, we can start to work with the nature of the prose, and really hone the craft of a story. Because like any job, it is work. And that's where the editing, the rewriting comes in. So just not be warned, but I suppose it is a warning that writing does take um, a lot of energy. It does take a lot of work. And um, it can also be very exciting and, and very satisfying. So what I'm going to do is basically for the next, um, let's say, 15, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about the nature of prose, 
um, how to hook the reader, perhaps how to structure a story. And then after that, we're going to give you an exercise. Um, and, and we're hoping that in that exercise, you'll be able to bring some of these things together and just get some of your own ideas going for your own story. So the nature of prose, the, the prose is the ordinary language that is spoken or written. It has a natural flow and it differs from, let's say, uh, poetry um, um, or um, yeah, other, other sorts of literature. It's basically you are telling a story and the more authentic the voice is when you're telling that story, the better. And it's something I don't think we have put down in our workshop, but voice is really important. Each of you here today has your own voice. You know how you talk to your friends, how you speak to your children. Um, are you a comical person? Are you more serious? Are you thoughtful? Um, do, you, do, do you tend to use a more flowery language? Do you tend to be more simple? And the reason I'm stressing this is in prose, you're going to find your own speaking voice is going to come into the way you actually write. So you also have to learn to trust your own voice. So the nature of prose is to convey an idea, to, to deliver information, to tell a story. And that's, that's really what we are promising the reader. When they pick up the short story, when they're hooked from that first sentence, we are promising to deliver them some kind of story in the same way that, you know, clicking onto Netflix series promises us something. We, the, it, it, and, and just to go back to what you were talking about, Karina, your, your character, your first line, there's a promise implicit in that. So just to talk a little bit about uh, the structure of any kind of fictional story in general terms, what you, you know, and, and I'm going to talk sometimes in quite basic terms for, for perhaps the, the writers who are watching who have perhaps haven't written a short story or haven't written fiction. But basically, I'm going to talk in terms of beginning, middle, and end. And Karina, you've, you've discussed quite a lot of this. But just to go back to those beginnings, um, what we need to do is hook the reader. The short story generally starts right with the action. And I'm going to go to your example of that, these children who find a hand in a plastic bag. We don't know anything about these children. We don't know their history. We're not told about who their parents are or where they go to school or how old they are. We're not given any of those details. And that's actually what the short story is all about. It hooks you right from the start. It gets you going right from the beginning. Sometimes when we write a rough draft, we have to go into the background of, the, of our characters because we need to learn about who they are. But when we actually write the story, what we want is the hook. There's no time to set a lengthy scene. There's no time for personal histories, no time for lengthy descriptions. Basically, we want to begin the unfolding action. And as Karina said, we've got, you know, between um, 3,000 and 5,000 words in the case of fluid to, to work through the story, to set that hook, and then to, to have a structure of the story that's going to carry the reader right through to the end, to some kind of final epiphany. So Karina spoke about the story being revealed through plot, um, and I like to think of plot is the steps of the story. So if let's say your story is a volcano blows up, some people die, some people survive, a hero saves somebody. The plot would be what are the actual steps? How is that story going to unfold? So you would have people arriving on the island, the volcano blowing up, some people drowning, uh, some people heading out um, for help. So each of those becomes a, a step that's, that's going to carry the character through the actual story. So that's the difference between story and plot. And, and I think it's important to, to understand that distinction because people often say, oh, I'm going to write a story. And it's often confused with plot. The story is what happens in general terms, that volcano blowing up and there's a hero and someone is saved. But the plot is how does that story unfold? What scenes do we write? What dialogue do we write? What steps do we choose to show 
to finally work through the unfolding of the story. So, yeah, just to go back to beginnings, um, what I've done is I have just um, uh, got a few examples that I'm going to read out for you. The first one is a, a from a story by Stephen Simons called My Cuban, and it starts off like this. I once killed a man. That is the first line. So you can see already how we are completely hooked. We are curious. We want to know, first of all, who is the I in the story? Who did he kill? How did he kill him? Is this a confession? What are we going to learn in the story? So just remember, your story's got to entice the reader. You want that, that you want the reader the reader's curiosity to be ignited, because once the, that curiosity is, is ignited through that first sentence, then they're more willing to read the second sentence, the first paragraph, and so on and so on. So in Stephen's story, he goes back and forth from present to the past, describing ultimately how he shot down a plane in the war. But it's a memory from many, many years ago. And it's a really interesting structure. So of course, some stories can go from point A to Z. They can go from, uh, and I'm, again, I'm just picking up on your example, Karina, the arriving on, on the island, enjoying the sights, um, until finally the hero saves um, whoever needs to be saved after the volcano is blown up. So that is basically what we call a linear story, okay? It goes from one point to the end. And you don't have to write that uh, uh, write a story like that. Um, it can be as, as in Stephen's story that um, he set the scene just you know through that, that first line, I once killed a man. Um, he then goes back into the past. He's sitting in his, in his airplane. He is at war, but it's memories. And then he comes back to the present. He's lying in bed with his wife 20 years later. So it's quite an interesting structure. So when we talk about structure, it's how is that story told? Is it linear or are you going to try and be experimental and do something a little bit different with it? The, another opening line is from a story by Nsika Goguana. It's called Home Cooked, and it goes like this. It was already late afternoon when she arrived from doing the shopping at the taxi rank. Nomafa anxiously arranged the ingredients for a simple chicken stew across the cupboard counter, four half-frozen pieces of chicken, an onion, and two tomatoes. Again, we are not told what kind of job she does or what else she bought or about her struggles to find chicken at ShopRite or whether she had a child with her. We're not given any of that detail. We're basically thrown into the story. We know she's going to make a meal, which becomes a vital way of actually how the story unfolds because her anxiety increases as she's making this meal, because she's making it for her husband. And we learn through the plot, through the action that happens, that this is an abusive man, and she needs to have the dinner just right. But it, again, it is a great way to get us into the story. She, you know, we are not told um, as I said, about her history or any of the detail, we simply put in the story, there is Nomafa making the meal. I've also chosen a first line from a Mishka Husen story. And the first line, um, the story is called Wedding Henna. Um, I forget which collection it comes from. Um, I think it's uh, Trade Secrets. Yes, here we go, which was um, one of the last books that was done um, by uh, Short Sharp Stories. And um, the first line is, it's a line of dialogue. It's a bride who says, okay then, make me beautiful. So again, the, 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 the makeup artist is there to apply the wedding henna to the bride's hands. So already just in that first little bit of sentence, in that first line of dialogue, we have this explosive action. She wants to be beautiful, it's her wedding. Um, then the narrator of the story goes on to say, she laughed as I unpacked my bag, the Tupperware with thick dark henna paste, 
the strips of mylar wrapping, a batch of good Rajasthani henna. So uh, we're now brought into the story with the kind of, with the, with the detail that is described by the makeup artist. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, about how we use detail to hook the reader as well. Um, I've got one more opening line, um, which um, um, I'm not sure which story it comes from. The day closes in on itself, snapping shut like a purse. Um, yeah, sorry. Sometimes even us presenters get confused <laughs> with our material, and I didn't jot down which which story this comes from. What, but what I liked about it is that we are, we put right into, into the end of the day. The day closes in on itself. I think it's a Megan Ross story. Snapping shut like a purse. Just that, district, the, that descriptive element um, really makes one want to really get into that story and what has happened during this day. What has happened that it closes so abruptly. All right, so basically what I'm saying is you need a hook for the reader. You want to get them to be interested in the story, to start reading the story. And then what happens is the story moves forward. And this is where we talk generally of the middle of the story. And really what it is, is cause and effect. All stories are basically structured around the golden rule of cause and effect which is, is basically that something happens. And then because that something happens, uh, there's, there's um, an effect. So the volcano blowing up, people will become injured, people will scream. If the hero hears someone scream, the effect is that he will run to that person and he will try to help them and so on and so on. So it's always helpful to remember when one's trying to develop a story, what happens next? Because that's really what we want to try and do in a short story, is move the action along, even if the action takes place in one person's head. Because I'm not proposing that you all write action stories, but a story does need to move to that final line, to that final epiphany. So always remember that uh, when you get stuck, what happens next? What can happen in the story? What, what effect will there be? For example, if a makeup artist is applying henna to the bride's hands, will she think it's beautiful or will she think it's badly done? If she thinks it's badly done and throws her toys out of the cot, then what will happen? So those are the kind of choices that one makes all the way along the line as one writes a short story. And basically, you are going to work to what I've said is some kind of change, some kind of conclusion by the end of the story. And it doesn't have to be mind blowing. It can be a shift within the character. The character can have learned something about him or herself. It can be a major shift between two characters. It can be, if one considers a crime fiction story, it can be finding out who actually committed the murder. So it can be as concrete as that, or it can be as psychological as a subtle shift within the character that the character finds something out about himself, something about how he does life, something about how he, how he operates within his own life. So in, in very simple terms, that is a short story as well. It's coming up with an idea, starting to write about it, allowing your character in that setting to do things. Those things that your character does will affect the other characters, will, will affect the, uh, the next step of the story and so on. Now we're gonna come to another very basic um, tenet of, of all fiction writing, which is show, don't tell. Showing, basically is around being specific and paying attention to detail. Telling is writing a scene, is, is writing a sentence. Um, let's just to, to get to, to that specifics, um, is writing something but reporting on it. Whereas showing is creating something in visual terms, almost like creating a scene 
of a movie that the reader actually feels immersed in, that the reader feels is immediate and that the reader feels they're taken into the world of the author and they are experiencing this world that the author is creating. So for instance, when we're trying to create these word punch uh, pictures, if you have a violent man, you're not going to say the man got angry. You're going to show him punching a hole through the bathroom wall. You're going to show him retracting his fist. You're going to show him looking at the blood. You're going to, you're going to include the detail of this man shouting at his wife. You are going to come up with a scene that really shows us how angry this man is without possibly ever using the words anger or abuse. You, if we, if we think about war, we're not going to say in the story, we're not going to tell the war was brutal. It's much more powerful if we use words such as the burnt shoe of a child lay at the side of a bombed car. And we describe that shoe, we describe the building. Um, already that sentence, it just creates this desperation of war, that children are hurt, that children's clothing is left burnt, that an, an ordinary station wagon, let's say, has been burnt, burnt out, um, which brings to mind a family car, what happened to the family. So again, it conjures up the, the curiosity that is needed for the reader to keep on reading. Um, again, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your uh, protagonist is driving a car, tell us which one, whether it's a family Volvo or a Mazda uh, Miata sports car, it's going to already say something about that character. Um, does your character prefer to bath or does your character prefer to shower? Does your character like to lie in a languorous bath or do they just want to get it done quickly and, and wash under the armpits and get on with their life? So, Karina, this also goes back to what you were saying. You need to know your character. You've got to understand your character and you will understand your character increasingly as you write about your character, as you put your character in your setting and as you as you have your character in action doing things. Um, another thing that I'm going to talk about is um, the, you know, the way we write um, purple prose. So I'm just I'm just talking about some of these some of these um, you know, kind of phrases that come up in writing. Purple prose is is prose that is basically too flowery, too wordy. For example, the mahogany-haired adolescent girl glanced fleetingly at her rugged paramour, a crystalline sparkle in her eyes as she gazed enraptured upon his countenance. A lot of new writers tend to think that good writing is big words. Uh, but strings of adjectives, strings of adverbs, and even more experienced writers tend to make that mistake. And it can work, but most of the time it doesn't work because it's called overwriting. And so what we'd like, you, uh, like to encourage you to do is to write with more simplicity. Um, so uh, yeah, just to go back to that, to that example of, of Damon Galgut, Karina, I think that was a beautiful example because he is so sparse. Another phrase that is used in the writing world is beige writing, which, which really comes down to a style that favors brevity and simplicity. It's plain common words that are easily understood by readers and it favors shorter words over longer words. I don't particularly write, like that idea of beige because beige to me is like, you know, very old ladies, big panties, which uh, doesn't um, really seem to be very exciting at all. But I think if one can write somewhere in between, avoid the purple prose um, and uh, beige, let's, let's up it a little bit, you know, let's include a little bit of color in the writing, some metaphor, some exciting language. Um, so have fun with the writing as well, but remember as well, and it comes back to voice. What is your voice? What is your style of writing if you have one? Or how do you tell a story? Um, you know, I think a lot of people then get confused about showing, not telling. They say, yes, but you're telling me to tell my story. 
but we tell the story by showing the story, by showing the scenes, by showing the details. You can hear the train in the background now, apologies for that. Um, okay, I'm going to read three examples as well. Um, oh, to your dialogue. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a few words about dialogue as well. It's a, it's a great way to move a story along. Dialogue puts us right there in that conversation. We are with the characters as they speak to each other, as they share information, as they share details about each other, um, as they share details about uh, a setting or whatever. One can incorporate so much into dialogue. So I'm also going to just look at a, a couple of examples. Um, so if you can, um, Emma, if you can just put, put one of those up. Um, okay, let's see which one we're going to start with. All right, this is from The Miracle Maker. Um, okay, which is by um, um, uh, oh dear, Emma, have you got the name of the writer? Agun Biade. It's also from uh, Trade Secrets. All right, okay, great, here we go. It's from the middle of the story, but I just want to show you how dialogue really works to move things along and also how dialogue sets atmosphere. A large woman close at hand in a pew shouted, it's me, man of God, I receive. Amen and hallelujah trumpeted the crowd. I have a message for another. The Lord told me your grandchild is down with, yes, a terrible disease, diphtheria. The Lord says, I will heal the child. An old woman wailed and held her hands in prayer as she heard the miraculous news. And so it went on and on. A man on crutches became firm and strong enough to throw away his props. A deaf man could suddenly hear. A woman with a persistent flow of blood got her plumbing corrected. A sterile woman testified to being pregnant after being prayed for by the prophet only a month previously. A banshee-like scream interrupted the litany of the prophet. My child, my child, a woman stumbled from the doorway towards the altar. The congregants taking up her wild cry as she ran forward, a child in her arms. Man of God, my child is dead. I was close enough to see it all. This is where the narrator comes in. The child was laid on the bare floor. Sorry, I can't see the, the, the rest of it. Um, Emma, can, can we? Okay, the, there we go. The child was laid out on, on the bare floor. He did not move. The prophet asked, what happened to him, dear mother? He was sick. I brought him to be healed, but it is too late. She thrashed on the ground. Her limbs flailed while her shrieks rang off the walls. I was moved by the passion exhibited by the woman, the fervor of the service seeping into me. Prophet Radebe shouted, bring him to me. But the woman was incapable and fell, on a fell in a dead faint alongside her child. The prophet and his deacons formed a ring around the mother and child. They held hands and prayed. The congregation prayed along, asking God to spare the life of the child. A thousand throats shouted prayers, punctuated by a thunderous amen. In the name of God who called me, the prophet swayed. I say, child, rise up. I watched through half-lidded eyes. The mother stood shaking, keening. An end was called to the prayers. The prophet shook his head. So all of this is basically told from the point of view of the narrator, the I voice. But he is recounting the story and he's using dialogue in which to do that. So it really brings things to life. And that's why I really think that dialogue is a great way to move a story along and to share in information. Um, okay, let's move to the next, the next um, extract. You know, we're also learning through that dialogue about the nature of the story that there is a prophet involved. This prophet is an actual chancer. He steals people's money. He professes to cure people. But by the end of the story, we realize that he's, he's basically taking advantage of people. So that is how that story moves along. But that dialogue makes it exciting and it puts the reader right there in the action. This story is 
by Lester Walbrook. And it is, Karina, do you remember the story's name? Because I didn't write it down. Airs and Graces. It's Airs and Graces. There we go. Airs and Graces. Desmond A. Daniels gazes out through her bedroom window. It is a gray afternoon. The town is in a rain cloud, muting the yapping dog down the road and a hammering somewhere in the murk. But the drip of a gutter at the corner of their house is as clear as the crackle of lightning. Like the other houses on the block, theirs is a three-roomed RDP affair, a sorry excuse of a thing with a cinder block toilet in the backyard and a tap next to it. But unlike the other houses, theirs has a fresh coat of paint and the yard is swept. Their fence is new. She turns from the window and in the shard of mirror stuck to the wall runs a hand over her hair. If there is one thing that no one can teach Lokis, it is relaxing and blow drying. The kinks are out. She grabs her beanie from the bedside table, pulls it over her head, tucking the stray strands underneath its edges. Her hair must stay straight. So, okay, I'm not going to read the whole um, the whole piece, but again, just to see how we are placed immediately in that scene, how um, Desmond Ney is um, is is in her house, and and that first scene tells us so much about the home. The setting tells us that it's. It's, it's, it's in a disadvantaged area. She's not a wealthy person. She, she looks at herself in a slither of mirror. We are told about the weather. And if one reads on, we can see how worried she is about the weather and how it's going to affect her hair. So we're thrown right into the story. This little extract as well goes on to her concern about whether Johan will be here, there with his, with his blue eyes and his fine blonde hair. So automatically we know that there's some kind of love interest, that, that something interesting will happen between these, these two characters. And so we're thrown into the story almost immediately. Okay, let's look at the, at the last extract, which is, um, I think it's just a short one. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about detail. Um, is when, when we are writing, and it comes back to this whole idea of show, not tell, the way to really engage a reader is to offer them detail. Um, as I said, you know, that, that burnt shoe at the, at the side of the road near the bombed out car, um, any kind of detail. The, this and rely on your senses the scent the of of home brewed coffee um the color of a dress that someone is wearing so don't just say she wore a red dress um, what kind of red is it does it swirl at her ankles or is it a mini skirt so it's those kind of details that will make your story come alive and i just wanted you to read this small piece here because I love this detail. It's from a story called Ramosela by um, um, Reso Ketswe Manenze. By then we had entered Mole Mole. We were only 10 minutes away from the crags of the Sechopo Mountains. Because the road twisted so suddenly like a snake coiling and uncoiling its folds on some cursed branch, dipping into an endless spiral we had to swerve in and out of again and again. Samson had slowed his driving. If I was going to escape, this was the best time to try. What I'd like you to notice is just the detail there and that the writer hasn't said it was a twisty road. She has actually put herself into that setting. She's imagined how the road twists and turns like a snake. So just bear that in mind as well. You know, again, it, it can go terribly wrong if we, if we ended up, end up in the territory of purple prose, but we also do want to have visceral detail. And when I talk about visceral detail, that is the kind of detail that you can feel in your body. When you read a story and you read that sort of description, 
it actually brings that road to life. We see it as a snake, not merely and simply as a twisty road. All right, what we are going to do now is, now that we've spoken a little bit about the elements of short story, and we've given you some ideas about the structure of a short story, show, don't tell, use dialogue, find detail. We're going to move into a part two of the workshop, which is for you and your pen to, to do a little bit of writing yourselves. Um, because our theme is fluid, what we thought we'd do is, Karina, perhaps you can just say what fluid means to you. For me, it's gas, liquid, bodily fluid, free flowing, graceful, elegant. And then I wrote down a few antonyms, rigid, strict, solid, firm, static. So for me, it is fluid against rigidity. Um, and Karina, won't you tell us what fluid means to you and then to, to introduce our first part of the exercise? So, the, the the first and most obvious uh, I think connotation is uh, and and uh, this is where the idea comes from in the in the first place is fluidity. It's uh, such a hot uh, word right now. It's with us in all kinds of contexts, especially in connection with identity, with sexuality. Um, so so that would be an obvious place to go. And when I was thinking about this theme, if I was to contribute a story, I was immediately thinking, where would I go that would be unusual? And I don't want to suggest any ideas, but the first thing that came to my mind was this very bizarre, strange thing that I heard that maybe other people know about um, or knew about before that. But I heard that uh, Desmond Tutu, when he was uh, buried, that he didn't have an ordinary uh, cremation, that his, uh, the, the way his body was decomposed was not by fire, but by a process that is called aquamation. And what happens there is, the way it's ex explained is that by he that, that heated alkaline water is somehow put under pressure and that liquid, that fluid, then decomposes the body within something like 12 hours. And usually we know that when um, alkaline um, uh, ground or earth, soil, uh, is around a body, uh, uh, not decomposed body, it takes about 20 years to, to do the same work. So I found that fact extremely fascinating. I also found it fascinating that Desmond Tutu uh, chose uh, to be, um, um, yeah, to, uh, that, that his body would go uh, under this, this process. Um, so, yeah, so, so that, that would be a thing that if I were to contribute a story to Fluid, I would want to explore this acclimation. Um, so that would be an, an unusual, maybe, or, or a slightly bizarre way of approaching it. And uh, yeah. What we would like okay. to do right now is we will start with very simple exercises. And the first one is we will give you, I think we said three minutes, uh, Joanne. Yeah, yeah. just a short, yeah. yeah. Please just jot down what comes to your mind when you hear the word fluid fluidity. Just a few ideas.
Are we supposed to be typing uh, our ideas down on? No, the no, no. no. Just for yourself. Okay. Yeah, this is really just a way for you to get into um, a little tiny bit of free writing about what fluid means. Do, do, does what comes up for you when you think of the word fluid? Just you can make a list, you can write a few sentences, you might already have some ideas. So just, you know, just trust yourself. You've got another one minute. Okay, so my my little alarm just went off. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, sometimes it's, it's actually quite handy to have a, a short time frame to jot down a few ideas because it's a way of tricking your mind. Um, and I'm just looking in the comments section. A few people wrote down the ideas there. Water, menstruation, drowning, liberation, art, poetry. Um, that was from Fiona Khan. Tosca wrote changing form, soft water can erode a hard stone, water seems to find a way to flow regardless of obstacles. Yeah, Karina said, love these, thank you. So I'm sure each of you will have written down a few sentences, a few words, um, and if we had to read them all out, we'd be surprised at the, at the variations that there are. But that was just to get you going with our exercise. So what we are going to do now is um, Karina, are you going to um, introduce no. this, this exercise? Yeah. I great. just want to apologize. I accidentally wanted to copy something completely different into the uh, chat to everyone. Uh, it's a uh, uh, sorry, I copied in a survey that the Cape Flats Book Festival did. <laughs> so please okay. ignore. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I absolutely love the uh, the um, uh, few ideas that you had. Um, so what we are going to do next is please list, so really just lists, so no sentences, just three lists, uh, uh, lists of three of the following, three different characters, three different settings, three different times of day, and narrator times. So three characters, three settings, three times of day, and three narrator types that you can imagine, anything that comes to mind. And we're gonna give you three minutes for that as well. Three characters, three settings, three times of day, three different points of view. Joanne, you are keeping time again, yes? I am keeping time. We have one more minute. Okay, I think by now we should all have our uh, characters, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, all right. So, what, yeah, Karina, do, uh, are you going to continue with this exercise? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. So, now, simply by what, whatever appeals to you most in the moment, choose one of these. Choose one of your characters that you, you have on the list. Choose one of the settings. Choose one time of day and one of the narrator types. And these are your uh, main four elements and with these 
for about five minutes, just stick to these chosen elements and feel yourself into the first scene that comes to mind and just start writing whatever comes. And it doesn't have to be edited, just go with the flow. So five minutes and choose one of each and see what happens. And for those who aren't au okay with free writing, just remember this is just a spontaneous bit of writing. You want just to actually allow yourself to write within the space and time. And um, so don't judge anything. It's, it's entirely for yourselves and it might spark off some ideas. Okay.
Karina, has that been five minutes? My clock doesn't seem to be. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, I think it has yeah. been. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. I put the wrong numbers in the cell phone. So, <laughs> okay. All right. So, I hope that everyone's at least managed to write uh, three or four sentences. Some people write faster than others. Um, I hope that you were able to just let your imagination go. Before we go to the next part of the exercise, I'm going to just read a few of these um, out in the from the chat. Sabelo Radebe has said, we believe what we perceive. So that I take it as your idea of fluid. Frankie, the fluidity of synchronicity, sand over sand dunes. I mean, that's lovely. So it's got nothing to do with the more literal water. Sabelo, again, characters, SNR, SM, SR. Um, Sabelo setting, King Sharker International Airport, Durban CBD, Uber ride. We're already getting a sense of a story here. Um, yeah. So um, what we're going to do now is you've all placed your characters in a setting. Either that character has simply um, um, had some, some thoughts. They've connected with their inner world. Perhaps they've done something, they've started to fry up the onions for the evening meal or whatever. The next five minutes, what we'd like you to do is we'd like something or someone to enter the scene or to be brought into the scene and then to write what happens between them. It could be a person who enters the room. It could be a sister, a brother, a ghost. Perhaps your character sees something in the room. It could be a memory that enters the room. It could be a vase of flowers or your character perhaps opens a drawer and sees something there that he uses or perhaps that, that triggers some action. Is there dialogue? Do, do these, do, does your character and the new entity, do they communicate in any way? Uh, do they know each other? All of these things will jump into your mind once you decide on whatever it is enters the scene and it's going to make the scene move forward. Just remember as well, if you bring a gun into a story, then you better use it. So um, whatever your character finds now is going to, or, or whatever person your character interacts with, with is going to play a major role most likely later on in the story. So again, what we'd like you to do is simply to free write the next part of the scene that you're writing in any way you choose. Remember as well, it's, it's simply a way to, to free yourselves up, to enjoy a little bit of writing and let's see what happens after that. Okay, five minutes. And Sabelo, maybe you can share what what happens next in your story since it's in the comments, which I think is helpful for other people to see as well. Great. Okay.
Okay, five minutes is gone. It goes very quickly. Mm. So I wish we had a whole morning to do this, but, um, yeah. you know, at, at least, you know, what uh, the hope is that uh, you'll get some ideas that you can actually take home with you and work on at a later stage. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Karina. The, ne the next will not be uh, five minutes, just 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 two minutes, really. And this you don't have to write down in full sentences, but just think about now brainstorm. And this can be in any way. You can make bubble maps. You can do lists. You can, I don't know, uh, when you are doing this on, on your own, you can shower, go for a walk. Whatever brings the ideas forward is just in a few keywords. Please write down what you think is going to happen next in the story. And it can be a whole lot of things. It can be what happens next and what happens after that and what happens next, merely possibilities. Just to say that, you know, a lot of people think writing is just that one has to have the, the vision to just sit down and write a story from the word go to the last line. It often doesn't happen that way. Stories can arrive in stages, little by little. So just bear that in mind as you write. Making lists, um, loosening the mind is all part of how we actually write a story. I just want to read Sabelo Radebe's uh, 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 comment there. The young lad had his luggage packed. He was awaiting a plane flight to San Francisco. He believed this so much that he relayed the idea to his immediate family. The last bit of money his mother had saved up, up from her hard labor was spent towards his travels. Unfortunately, it seemed the young lad was led astray. Okay, so there we go. That's a perfect example. What can happen next? So, Sabello, we look forward to the next installment. And everybody, you've got five minutes now.
All right, did you all hear that? That is our five minutes done. So hopefully at this stage, you will have some ideas of what's going to happen next in your scene or your story. And remember as well, a story is often made up or is made up of various scenes. Uh, the, you know, the kind of visual aspects of, of, of storytelling. So yeah, unfortunately we don't have um, an entire day, an entire afternoon, whatever, to, to do more of these exercises. Because I think what it shows is how we can actually just move from step to step in creating a story. Um, Karina, what would you like to say? Um, I, I think if we could possibly maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe somebody would be happy to read out their very short uh, uh, passage to share it with others and see what happens so that you have more ideas of what the others did and uh, possibly also maybe answer some questions because we are gradually running out of time. Um, so shall we do that? Uh, I, I saw that Erica, yeah. Erica um, uh, has quite... Uh... Yes, perhaps Erica, um, would you yeah. like to come online and, and, and read those to us? Um... <laughs> Especially the first paragraph? Yeah, so um, let me just quickly go. Um, so my character was a murderer. The setting was a rainy orchard. It was dusk and the narrator was first person. <laughs> I don't know how I came up with those. So anyway, then I just wrote, my daddy always said rain is a blessing, never an inconvenience. Well, I'm bloody inconvenienced now. I'm wet and cold and miserable, but the worst of it is that it's obscuring my view of that all important veranda where my target sits every day at the same time. Perhaps he thinks the setting sun will absolve him of his sins. I wonder what he thinks as he sips his drink, whiskey from the looks of it, and watches the sun dip behind the horizon. Then again, perhaps the rain is a blessing, his blessing. If it doesn't stop soon, he won't die today. Uh, thank you, you Erika. The, uh, the, the, read the second part as well because that we can see how it's progressed oh and then you said a character enters so i thought well the oak's gonna go sit on his chair i suppose there he is my stomach lurches as it, as it has done every day for the past two weeks when he sits on the wooden bench he's aged we've all aged i guess he's too far away for me to make out his eyes not that i need to they haunt me in my sleep but I wonder if they are still that blue, still able to pierce your soul. I wish I was brave enough to walk up to him and look him in the eyes before I take his life. I was a coward then, I'm a coward still. He's going to die without knowing it's me who has decided his time has come. Judgment day, his favorite topic back then. Ooh, I think we have a budding crime writer in our midst. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think what becomes clear is when we give ourselves permission with just a very few characters just spontaneously and we allow ourselves to write, then the ideas do flow. It's a little bit like turning on a tap. You turn on the tap and the water will come. So remember that when you sit down and write, the ideas will come. And once one has ideas, those ideas generate other ideas and so on and so on. So don't be afraid. Yeah, okay. and I, I think it's uh, Erica's example shows that obviously you would want to go back and start uh, um, uh, rewriting and editing, but but very clearly there is already a story in mind. Uh, these are very strong two characters. You you know that there must be some kind of a past relationship between them. Uh, that obviously the one wants to kill the other, and the theme is introduced in that remarkable. Way of of uh, somebody in the main character's story, uh, in this case, a father um, telling um, her or him about the blessings of rain, and here rain becomes possibly a blessing because it saves somebody's life. But we are also immediately hooked and want to continue reading. Will the 
character, the, the main character, the narrator, succeed in their mission to actually assassinate this person? And what ha what what horrible thing things have they done in the past that the, this warrants the killing, um, the murder? So so and and I love the comment from uh, Karen Hurt here. This process uh, process is great. It is fascinating to see how much is possible in five minutes sprints. And, and that is really what it is about. When you give yourself, like Joanne said, permission to actually sit down and focus and allow your imagination to have free reign, um, amazing things happen. Uh, it's the, very often the most difficult thing to do is really to, to sit down and do it. Uh, but once you do, once you are in front of the empty page, uh, things begin to happen. And, and when you encounter difficulties, like we said before, there are all these tools at your disposal that you can try out to see, well, I've got this idea. This is, this is the kind of story that I would like to tell, but it's not working this way. So maybe I need to create some kind of, the, of a distance. Maybe I have to introduce a different narrator. Maybe my main character is not going to be the main character after all. Maybe his or her best friend needs to tell the story and so on. And you can really explore. Um, and very often really magical things happen if you take a passage and just rewrite in one way just by changing the tenses or changing from a descriptive passage to, to dialogue and, and just exploring what is the best tool at your disposal to tell the kind of story that you would like to share. Yeah, I, I just want to mention as well, um, someone said in the comments, I think it's Amy or uh, Amy, that it's, it's hard. Um, she's realized she's telling, oh, there we go. Okay, Amy. Um, it's so hard. I put my characters in a setting, then I realized I was telling, not showing. Sometimes we do actually need to tell and then go back in the rewriting and find the detail that makes it come alive. So don't be too hard on yourselves. It's really just getting down the bones, finding your characters, um, deciding on setting, um, all of those, those elements that, that um, add to the story. So don't think you've got to do it all in one go. Um, we're hoping that perhaps someone else would like to share, someone who hasn't put their story in the comments, but someone who'd like to um, like to, 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 to share with us. And while we wait for somebody to... Uh, May I? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to answer here somebody's question before we continue. Uh, is there another platform for finding out about short shop stories? Uh, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, do, don't worry, I'm also not on Facebook. But if, if you Google short shop stories, uh, you will be able to find quite a lot of material that Joanne has compiled over the years. There will be also reviews, there will be interviews with authors, there will be write-ups, uh, there will be other calls for stories. And of course, the absolute best source to find out more is to go back to the other anthologies and, and read what is uh, available already that will give you an idea of what kind of story will make it into the, um, into the books. Yeah. And, so and every person on this, uh, on this uh, platform today will be getting a follow-up email with um, information about short shop stories and how to contact us, how to send in your story, and how to um, how to approach the theme? Yeah, shall we go to who wanted to share with us? I'm happy to I did. Like it's Fiona Khan. Fiona. Okay, great. Yes. Fiona. Um, because I am not used to this genre, and I just needed a little help. Okay, here it goes. I looked be uh, below between my legs at the mess. I was now a woman, but what woman would be attractive and appealing at the cut, the mutilation, the violation of me, my core, my sexuality? I may as well be dead. I am dead. The searing pain, the deafening scream, the strong arms pinning me on the ground and stretching my legs to reach the east and west of the horizon. Um, a shining sliver wielded by my grandmother and then the blood, the blood, I never wanted to see again. Olvetu, my older sister, shoves the sanitary pad beneath my nose. Here, she gives me that sniggering look. She's always brash. 
scars from her katsuna, the genital mutilation, trauma. It never goes into the wind, but howls from our backs like seasonal hurricanes. Wait, perhaps a tornado snaking through the dusty land, swirling and collecting the dirt and spewing it in another place. Thank you, I scoffed and walked away. Mayor walked in with the hot water and swathes of muslin to wash and clear the blood, then dressed me for the family's fair. I was now a woman, but what is a woman? Who is a woman? Wow, thank you. Very powerful. And and you just did that in, in this, you know, the last- Yes, uh, I, just <laughs> yeah, I, okay. I just did it now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, again, for me, it's it's always, and I'm sure this is going to be true of every single one of you who has written something, is once one gets rid of that critical mind that says, oh, can I do this? And is there time? And will I do it right? Because, because you're kind of forced to, because it's only 15 minutes, you actually allow yourself to put the story down, to put the character down. And for me, it's always a tremendous surprise to hear people's stories. Um, so th thank you for that. Very powerful. And also, I mean, just the, 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 the genital mutilation, the blood, um, that's another way to look at fluid flowing, um, which, um, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of, but, um, yeah, it, I mean, to, it gives the, to be honest, the, a very yeah. political also and very important uh, uh, topical uh, dimension right now. So it's a great idea to explore. Sorry, Thank Joanne. You so much. Yeah, no, no, I, no. I, I, yeah, yeah. No, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Thank you. So much. Yeah. Okay. Um, would would we've got time to hear? Shall we hear one more? I'm happy to also read, Jo. Karen. Great. Karen. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, is that Karen? Okay, yes. Yeah, ah, yeah. Very different, I think, to the others. So here we go. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Yeah. Hanalee sat down, the aromas bursting from the rolling kitchen, the silverware lined up like soldiers going to war. The water in the crystal glass moved with the clack, clack, clack of the train's wheels, ratting over the tracks. She lightly touched the cross at her neck self-consciously. The waiter appeared at her shoulder, startling her. Would you like the a la carte menu or prefer to choose your own dishes, madam, he asked. Handy was tempted to order the a la carte, making her decision easier, but decided to take her time. The waiter disappeared as quickly as he appeared. Handy lifted the hard cardboard, um, sorry, Handy lifted the hard cardboard, her eyes straining to see the embossed menu. Excuse me, came from behind her. Yes, she responded quietly. Would you mind if I sat with you? It seems we are both with our partners on this journey. Handy heard the word, words, but couldn't make sense of the warm, flowing voice. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, different, a different voice completely. Um, yeah, and and successful as well. You know, um, also I, the dialogue. I, yeah, I, and I love the silverware lined up. You know, you've set the scene. Um, you've brought Hanley in, so one needs to just now extend that and and see what's going to happen next. So yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think what is important to note is, yes, that each person has presented a different piece of writing. Um, and I'm thinking of Sabelo's as well. I'm, I still want to know what happens to his young lad at the airport. And that is really what we want. We want different pieces. We want your authentic voice. Um, and someone asked as well, um, can the stories be true? Um, look, this is a fiction collection, so obviously it's, it is not true, it's fictionalized, but in fiction writing, what we find, what I find, is that most stories, if not all stories, are based on our own experience, on our own life experience, um, or on something that titillates us in the news, or a chat we've had with our husband, or a meal we've made ourselves. So just remember, it is going to come from, from one's own experience, not necessarily 
but one's own experience might then unlock the imagination to take us into into other realms. But um, yeah, but uh, was that Karen who read? I can hear your voice. You know, it's much more conversational. Um, it's it's you know it's there's no purple prose there at all. It's down to earth. So trust that that's the way you write. Um, you know, you you added the dialogue. So it really is about being authentic to to the to your theme and to the way you tell a story and to your own style. So Karina, would you like to add something? Um, I, I think that uh, we are gradually running out of time. We are so, 7.30, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so look, I mean, uh, I think- I, I yeah. think we can encourage everybody is that, you know, explore uh, the topic, explore it. You don't have to work on this story. It can be any other story. This can, can just give you ideas. And for our next session in two weeks time, please send all your questions in. We will try to, for, so in the next two hours, we will really just try to get through as, as many as, uh, questions as possible. Send them in advance uh, to the, um, uh, to the address given on the call for stories. Uh, Joanne, will you remember it by heart? Uh, um, the it's going to be on the email that will go out from all about writing so you can either send your questions to all about writing or I think it is um, short sharp stories dot fluid at gmail.com but we will include that um, and then we've also said that we will do a short writing exercise in the next workshop as well um, and I think we'll probably start with that next time but um, we haven't worked it out yet I mean, yeah, I just, you know, for me, I'm just really curious to hear more of your stories. For me, that is the most exciting part of, of this evening is, is having heard those stories, seeing some of the comments. Um, okay, just to address a few things in the next couple of minutes. Do we continue with the same story? Karina said, no, it can be a completely different story. This is simply to have loosened you up a little bit. Remember that you do need to write on the theme. So you can't just write any old story. It's got to address the theme in some way. But as we've seen, um, from desert sand, wind across dunes to menstrual flow, um, there are so many new and interesting ways of addressing this theme. And that's what we're looking forward to. Um, do we accept more than one entry? Um, no, only one entry. Um, but as Karina says, we'll address all those questions next time. Um, so yeah. a huge thank you to all of you. Thank you for uh, sharing, uh, for being here, for wanting to participate. And a huge thank you to All About Writing for hosting us. Uh, this is one of the greatest platforms for creative writing in, in South Africa and worldwide. So thank you so much. for Worldwide. Wow. That sounds good, Karina. Well, they're yeah. writing in Venice right now. <laughs> yeah, they are right. And in Portugal and in yeah. wherever. There were all sorts of exotic locations. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Joanne, as well, and uh, and happy writing. And please uh, be in touch, and we will uh, hopefully answer all your questions yeah. next time. And just one last thing: um, we spoke a lot about the elements of style. Um, you can go and Google those yourselves. Read articles about writing because writing is a learning process. So the more you read about dialogue or setting, the more it'll help you to understand how to use it in your own writing. So thanks again, everybody. And we will see you, I think it's the 3rd of November. So thank you again for joining us. And Karina, will you stay on the line? And, um, and Emma. Yeah. So to the rest. happy writing and reading and see you next time. Great. Cheers. Bye.